We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. So I've got to be honest with you that when I think about the book of Jonah, uh, the image that I just can't get by in my mind was from the children's book or Bible that we had in our home when I was growing up. And um, there was the story of Jonah, and on one page, there's this image of Jonah sitting inside the belly of a whale, and he's up to his waist in water. And then you turn the page, and on the next page, Jonah is being blown through the, the blowhole of the whale, and, um, and he lands on the beach. And so even when I think about the book of Jonah to this day, I have a hard time getting by that thought. And let's just be honest, uh, when I announced this series, A Better Way, and that I would be teaching through the book of Jonah, every one of you, your mind went to, oh good, I can't wait to hear what he says about the whale. And um, today, that's actually where we're diving into the story. So today's message, I'm entitling The Whale in the Room. The Whale in the Room. That's pretty good, wasn't it, right? All right, maybe you want, maybe not. Um, Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 17. We're stepping into the story at the end of chapter 1 this morning, and here's what the word says. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Now, a lot of you are like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your Bible says fish. It doesn't use the word whale. And that is because um, probably somewhere over the course of time, in an attempt to maybe make this miracle a little bit more believable, um, there was a theory that arose that it must have been a whale that God used to swallow Jonah. Because in our mind, we're aware of a whale, the size of a whale. Surely it must have been a whale that God used. Here's what we know, is that in the Hebrew language, the original language that Jonah was written in, that there's no word that, that distinguishes between a mammal, which is what a whale is, and then a fish. And so while this could have definitely been a whale, we don't know that definitively that it, it was. So as we look at this story, you know, there's a lot of questions that come to all of our minds when we think of the possibility of a human being surviving inside of a whale for three days and, and three nights. The question we've got to ask is, so what do we do with a verse like this? And the answer is, is we do with this verse what we do with any verse when we're trying to gain understanding and clarity, and that is we zoom out of the, from the verse and we get context, because context is the key to clarity. And so when you think about the context of this story about the whale and Jonah chapter one, remember, just to kind of rejog your memory to last Sunday in week one of this series, we know that God wants to extend his compassion and compassion to a very um, heinously evil and wicked and idolatrous city by the name of Nineveh. Now, the city of Nineveh was part of this wicked empire called the Assyrian Empire. So God calls Jonah, go and preach my compassion to this group of evil pe people, and Jonah doesn't want to go. So he's on the run. Now, before we're too hard on Jonah, as I said last Sunday, uh, what we read about the Assyrians is that they were, they were very, very mean people. They were a torturous group of people. In fact, here's a little bit of a, of a snapshot into history of what they did to their enemies. Assyrians boasted of their cruelty to captured peoples. Records brag of live dismemberment, often leaving one hand attached so they could shake it before the person died. They made parades of heads, requiring friends of the deceased to carry them elevated on poles. They boasted of their practice of stretching live prisoners with ropes so that they could be skinned alive. The human skins were then displayed on the city walls and on the poles. So now you're thinking what Jonah was thinking. Like God wants to give that group of people compassion? And what you should be thinking is this, if there's hope for them, then there's hope for me. If God is concerned with that kind of people, then surely God is concerned and has a heart for me as well. And so rather than let Jonah run, God pursues Jonah. Why? Because God, Jonah can't preach to the group of Ninevites what he hasn't first received himself. You can't give what you haven't first gotten yourself. And so what God wants to speak through, through Jonah, God has got to make sure that Jonah gets it. He's got to make sure that Jonah receives that compassion and taste of it 
bit personally. And here's what Jonah realizes, is that as he's on the run, there is nowhere that he can hide or that he can run from the presence of God. Psalm 139 and verse number 7. The farther you run, the more you realize there is no way I can escape. And let me just just give some of you a heads up this morning. The reason that your life is so miserable and your heart is so restless is because you are trying to run from God and you have come to this realization, there is nowhere I can go to run and hide from him. Why? Because he loves you way too much to let you continue down the path that you're on. He is relentlessly pursuing you. And so Jonah flees for the city of Tarshish, this Phoenician colony on the southern tip of Spain, and God sends a great storm while they're out there on the Mediterranean Sea. And you remember what happens? This whole boat full of pagan sailors, they actually turn to Yahweh. They turn to Jehovah, to Jonah's God. Now, remember what we said. Is this name used for God here that we see in the Bible, all capital letters, L-O-R-D? This is the name Yahweh or Jehovah, a loving and personal and compassionate God. And so while Jonah is running, God uses even his flight to turn all of these pagan sailors to himself. So here's just a quick recap so you don't miss it. God wants to save and extend his compassion to a wicked city. God pursues relentlessly his prophet who is running from him, and God converts an entire boat full of pagan sailors. And I tell you all of that because that is the context for what we're reading in verse number 17. The context for the great fish in verse number 17 is even a greater miracle that there is a self-existent God who wants to extend his compassion towards us, who relentlessly pursues us. That's the great miracle of the book of Jonah. And my fear is, is this true with me and could be true of all of us, is that we hear news like that and our heart doesn't skip a beat to think that God loves me so much that he would pursue me like he does. You know, sometimes it's very, very easy to kind of take the grace of God for granted. Sometimes it's very easy for us to forget where it is that we came from and where it is we would be if it weren't for his grace, where our marriage would be, where our family would be, where would we be if it were not for the grace of God? You see, this is the great miracle of Jonah, and it's very, very easy for us to kind of get used to that and just to assume that God owes us that and to hear of that kind of a miracle that God has worked in us and that God is still working in people, bringing new creation out of that which is dead, bringing to life that which is dead, to hear that and just to kind of let it do nothing for us. You know, this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. He describes this miracle, and he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. You want to talk about a miracle? Paul says, that's a miracle. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. A few months ago, our next-gen pastor, Tim, he preached And I'll never forget this line from his sermon. It grabbed my heart. He said, God owes us nothing but gives us everything. And until we are stunned by this truth, we will walk through this life with a sense of entitlement. You know, I alluded to this last Sunday, but the miracle of of God longing to be reconciled with the crown jewel of his creation, humanity, like this is the point of Jonah. The point of Jonah is not Jonah, and the point of Jonah is not the storm, and the point of Jonah is not the whale, and the point of Jonah is not Nineveh, it's not the fish, it's none of that. The point of Jonah is the name and the character and the glory and the compassion and the greatness and the mercy of our God. This is the point of Jonah. Now, with that context established, we look at verse 17. Again, but the Lord provided a great fish. Now, circle, underline, star, this word provided. Here's the reason why. It's because in the Hebrew, the original language, this word means to assign, to prepare, to appoint, to tell. 
Now, the form of this word, it's in what's called the P-I-E-L, P -I -E -L, and it's a Hebrew term, and it indicates that this fish that is provided is a special assignment from God. That's what this means. This word provided means that this is a special assignment that's been given by God. So the Lord sent on special assignment a great fish to swallow Jonah, to rescue Jonah from his drowning into the depths of the sea. You say, Gabe, like, do you really believe that? And the answer is, absolutely I believe it. And here's why I believe it. In Matthew 12, 40, Jesus himself affirms the story of Jonah being in the belly of a whale for three days and for three nights as if it were historical truth. But here's a second reason I believe it, is when I consider the track record of God's special assignments in my life, like it's impossible to look back over the course of my life and not see the hand of God orchestrating circumstances and things and people time and time and time again, conversations, how that led to this and that email led to this and so on. Like it's impossible not to look back over the course of life and see the hand of God at work. What's fascinating is, is this word provided here, we actually see it used several other times in chapter four in the book of Jonah to refer to God using non-human things on special assignment. So God has this track record of this. You say, Gabe, I'm not so sure. Well, think of, think of this. Think about to maybe you're dating or maybe back to your days of dating. You're there alone with your boyfriend or your girlfriend and you know, one thing leads to another and it's going too far and you can't control yourself and then all of a sudden the telephone rings or the text message comes through. Was that random or was that a special assignment from God? You look at me like you have no clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know. <laughs> or you're driving into Charlottesville on Route 53 and you get behind that car. Or you're coming up Route 20 and you get behind that tractor. Or you're coming from Northern Charlottesville and you hit all of those red lights and you go into that bypass to get you to the next red light like 20 seconds faster. <laughs> and then you get up the road a little further and you see this accident that very well could have involved you had it not been for that car, or the tractor, or the red lights. Special assignments. You know, what blows my mind, and what I, maybe God will show us in heaven, is when we get there, maybe we'll have the opportunity to look back on life, and we will see all of those things that God orchestrated as special assignments that we're not even aware of, that you don't even know about. You know, I wonder right now, like, what's happening in life? Don't dismiss that. Perhaps it is a special assignment from God. The Lord provided this great fish, this special assignment to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and through for three nights. Now, here's what you've got to know, is that while the fish isn't the point of the story, the fish does make a point in the story. And so, when Jonah's throwing overboard through this fish, he first experiences the mercy and the compassion and the saving hand of God. And what is it that Jonah learns? Look at chapter 2. It says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, Jehovah Yahweh, his God. The name used there, his God. God is Elohim. It means the strong creator God, the one who sent the special assignment in the form of his creation. 
which by the way, if he is a strong creator God and he establishes the laws of nature and creation, is he not powerful enough to go beyond? Is he bound by those laws? Absolutely not. So he uses here the Lord his God, his strong creator God, and it says this in verse two. He said, in my distress, this word, it refers to the pains of childbirth. The, the labor pains. Think of those pains in life that come out of seasons of distress. And he answered me from the depths of the grave or from the heart of Sheol, which is the place of the dead in the Old Testament. What Jonah is saying is, I was as good as dead. Now look at what it says. I called for help and you listened to my cry. That word listen in the Hebrew is shema. It, it means from our angle here with the intent of obeying from the angle of God, it's like God like, could not wait to hear from Jonah. I was talking with a couple this morning after the first service, and, and they were just telling me a few struggles that they were going through and how they were feeling so isolated, and they were feeling even more shamed into isolation because they felt like they shouldn't be feeling what it is that they were feeling. And we talked about how the enemy loves to shame us into isolation. And I want you to know if that's you, and like you're even wrestling, like am I even worthy enough to be here? I want you to hear me this morning that God cannot wait to hear from you. He is listening for your cry right now. He can't wait to hear from you. And the enemy will do everything he can to shame you further and further into isolation. If you thought about that, God can't wait to hear from you. He's waiting for you to lift up your voice to him. What's that look like? Jesus, save me. God, help. Like, what's on your heart? What is it you need? God, I, I think of this. I think of Peter walking on the water, and he takes his eyes off of Jesus. He begins to sing, and he cries out, and he says, Lord, save me. And you know what I love about the next verse? It doesn't say that, that Jesus scolded Peter for taking his eyes off of him. The Bible says immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, and he caught him. Verse 3, you hurled me. This is the activity of God. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me, and all your waves and your breakers, like they were owned and controlled by this great creator God. They swept over me. It's like Jonah's in this washing machine. Verse 4, I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple, to the place where I can find life, to your presence, to the place of your presence. Verse 5, the engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O oh Lord my God. Now, I want to focus for just a moment on verses 2 through 6 in this prayer of Jonah. Because what happens is this, is that his content of the prayer, it proves a point or it makes a point, but there's a second thing you need to know, and that is the structure of this prayer. What Jonah does is he structures this prayer in what's called a chiasmus. Now, this is an Old Testament and kind of an ancient literature, literary device, and it's structured in such a way that you have parallel points that point to one central point. So I have it on the screen for you, but think of it like this. Point A, point B, point C, the center. Point B, which parallels the previous B, and then a point A, which pre uh, parallels the first A, okay? So in other words, verse two parallels with verse six. Verse three and verse five parallel one another. What does that do? It creates a center in verse number four, a theological center in verse number four. For those of you that are not like into Hebrew, and for those of you that are not even into English, like, <laughs> here's a better way to describe it. Think of it like an offensive line. You with me, men? All right. An offensive line, you've got a tackle, a guard, a, a guard, and a tackle, all right? And the center of that line is the, the center, 
In fact, the center of the whole offense is that center. A lot of times the quarterbacks get way too much credit and way too much glory, right? Without that center, there is no snap, there is no play, there is no offense. He is the anchor of that entire offense. And everything revolves around his position with the ball. And you know, when, when a quarterback fails to line up behind a center, like tragic things happen on the field. You say, does that happen? Absolutely, that happens. I want to show you this clip from an NFL game last year. Can someone remind me uh, where that quarterback went to college? <laughs> Virginia Tech. <laughs> no, we're going to let that sink in a minute. Some guy spoke up in the first service. He's probably never spoken a word in church his entire life. And he said, that didn't happen until he went to the bills. You know, that's the type of thing that happens in life when you don't line up behind your center. When you're not centered. And what happens here is that Jonah he points us to the center of his prayer in verse four. He said, I said, I have been banished from your sight. Anybody here today feel any regret? Jonah did. If I could go back and do it over, I would. If I could go back to that point when I first heard the voice of God, and I could go back there and say yes, I would. Anybody know what it's like to carry some regret? What Jonah knows is like, I can't change where I'm at right now. There's nothing I can do to change my physical position. There's nothing I can do to get out of this whale. I am completely at the mercy of God, which is the perfect place to be. Because here at rock bottom, in the middle of God's deliverance, the special assignment that God has sent for Jonah, look at what he says, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. I can't change where I am physically, but I can change the gaze of my heart. Let's learn from Jonah this morning. Maybe you can't change the mess that your marriage is in now. And maybe you can't change where your kids are at. And maybe you can't go back a semester and, and undo what you did. But do you know that the reality is, this is the beauty of the new creation and the mercy of the Lord, that you turn to your heart to him right here, right now, in this moment, and you have a brand new start. This is the miracle of Jonah. This is what's in front of us. And you know the great news is, is even for those of us, like we're trying to do it right, the, the, the reality is we're never gonna be right all the time. We're gonna screw up. And you know the Bible says that the mercy is new every morning. You may not be able to change where you're at right now or undo what you've done. But what you can do is you can learn from Jonah, is you can turn the gaze of your heart back to the source of all life, to the presence of God. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. Here's what's fascinating. You guys know the story in Numbers 21 of Israel in their desert or their wilderness wanderings and, and um, they have this season where they're getting bitten by snakes and they're dying from snake bite. 
Like, what a horrible thought, right? I've asked God, God, however I go, please don't let it be by snake bite. <laughs> They're dying from snake bite, and so Moses creates this bronze serpent. And the Bible says in Numbers 21, in verse number 9, that those who looked lived. And you know, it's the very same verb that Jonah uses here, yet I will look again. If I could just give you a word to take away from this morning, it would be very simply this, look and live. Look and live. You feel your heart slipping? Look and live. You feel that horrible attitude creeping back in? Look and live. You sense your gaze turning off of Jesus and onto whatever the idol is that you're tempted to allow to creep in and destroy the little foxes that destroy the vine, look and live. You know, the beauty is it doesn't matter where you're at, you can look and live. To look and live in your distress, in this pit that you find yourself in, you can do nothing about, look and live. I, I love what N.T. Wright says in his book, Simply Christian, you become like what you worship. And when you gaze in awe, admiration, and wonder, and wonder at something or someone, you begin to take on something of the character of the object of your worship. Meaning that if you want life, you've gotta to look to Jesus. You want life, you've gotta gaze at Jesus. Not your shame, not your regret, not all of the memories that the enemy keeps bringing back to you. You've gotta turn your gaze to Jesus. You've gotta look and live. So what does this do for Jonah's heart? Look at verse seven. He says, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols, they forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. And what I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And what of that special assignment? Verse 10, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. I just wonder how many of us this morning and what it is that we're facing that God is just waiting on us to look, to turn the gaze of our hearts back to his temple, the place of his presence and his glory you know that when it comes to encountering his presence, his glory, his power, his majesty, the heart can't stay neutral. This is why I pray many times over our people and over Sunday mornings, God, may we experience your presence in a powerful way. Why? Because our presence is your greatest, our greatest need. In your presence, Lord, my heart cannot stay the same. In your presence, Lord, my heart can't stay neutral. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. And you know, for many of us uh, this morning, maybe we've been walking with Jesus for a long time, or maybe it's been a short time. It doesn't matter, because every one of us knows the temptation to allow idols to creep in. And when I think of this, I think of the revelation that John received in Revelation chapter two by the church of Ephesus. And Jesus compliments the church in verses two and three of Revelation two. And then he says, nevertheless, there's a problem. And the problem is, is that you've left your first love. And he says, remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent. And I believe for a lot of us, Somewhere along the way, our heart has kind of drifted into this territory that God owes us. And we didn't go there overnight, but somewhere along the way, we have forgotten both the thrill and the relief of deliverance. What it was like to be set free. What it was like for God to command the fish to spit you out. What it was like to be on the backside, coming out of 
the trial that God used to reawaken your heart. I think there's a lot of us this morning that we need that reminder. And so he said, repent or else, meaning there's one option, meaning if there's anything, it could be a person, it could be a marriage, it could be a child, it could be a home, it could be a job. If there is anything, an attitude, if there's anything that you've allowed to creep in, in place of Jesus, just take time to take your eyes off of that and put it back on him to look and to live. And then, I believe there's a lot of people here that have never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And today, you're ready to make that decision. You're ready to look and to live for the very first time. You've never experienced true life. And today is gonna to be the first day of a brand new start in Jesus Christ. And if that's you, I wanna lead you in a prayer as an expression of faith in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sin. And I wanna invite you today to look and to live. Look to him and live. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time you've given us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your compassion and your forgiveness. And thank you, Lord, that ultimately, God, we have the story of Jonah, which is ultimately a story of your mercy and your compassion towards us. And today, Father, may we taste of it in a new and a fresh way. Rekindle our hearts as they grow dull over time. And then, God, I pray the day you would awaken hearts. Awaken them for the first time, maybe, to open their heart to you as Lord and Savior. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed and everybody's very still and quiet, if you're here today, you've never said yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Today, you're ready to say yes for the first time. I wanna invite you to pray this prayer with me as an expression of faith in Him. I'm gonna ask you to pray this out loud and I'm gonna ask that we all pray this out loud to support you as you make this decision for the first time. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin, and help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.